Dear God Almighty, please help us and prepare our hearts to hear your word. Lord, as, as I speak and the people listen, please help us to be un thinking about how we're to be under the authority of your word. Lord, I know that if anything of value that we're about to think about the next hour is from your word. So please help us now to not just hear your word, but to be doers of it. I pray this for your honor and glory. Amen. We've been going through a series during the time of break for Pastor Mark. The series has been your ministry in your home, which we covered last week, Sunday morning. Your ministry at work, which we covered last Sunday night. This morning, we have your ministry with the world. And this evening, you have your ministry with the church where Jimmy will preach again. Tonight, we, or today, we have Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. And you should have received an outline in the bulletin. I encourage you to use that so that you can follow along clearly. There's a story that's told about Charles Spurgeon and that in his day he had a church called the Metropolitan Tabernacle. And at the time it was the largest church in the world. So some people would come in and ooh and ah at the building, at the size of it. And Spurgeon was showing someone around one, one time, around the tabernacle, and he began to point to the different uses that they have of the building. And he said, let me show you the heart of the building. And he didn't go to the pulpit. He didn't go to the sanctuary. Instead, he went underneath the sanctuary. And he went to the boiler room. And he said, you see this room? This is where about 300 people pray for me as I preach to the thousands upstairs. And you see, Spurgeon knew that it's by the power of prayer that the gospel goes forward. So this text is about that combo. It's about your ministry to the world is to pray. And to pray fervently, to pray for others as they go, and to go yourself. The outline has it as one, to press on in prayer, two, to pray for your brothers, and three, to walk in wisdom with the lost. This text is about speaking to God about others and then speaking to others about God. Or as another preacher said, it's about the new man who has a new mouth. So now consider with me this text. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it, with thanksgiving. So first and foremost, let's consider the, the definition of prayer. I'm going to use the Westminster Confession. I'm going to do that because it helps me say a succinct, clear, powerful definition for you. It's not because I just like to read things that are from old guys. Think through how this is worded very carefully. What is prayer? Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to His will, in the name of Christ, with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of His mercies. Well, how are we going to know what to pray? Well, the Catechism tells us, the whole Word of God is used to direct us in prayer, but the special rule of direction is that form of prayer which Christ taught His disciples, commonly called the Lord's Prayer. So a disciple is teaching us to pray here in Colossians 4. And what does he say first and foremost about prayer in verse 2? He says that we are con to continue earnestly in it. This continue earnestly is one word, and it's describing how we are to endure, to hang in there, to courageously persist in prayer, to continue with an intense effort. The Lord Jesus Christ used this word when he was preaching near the lake, near the Sea of Galilee, and he told the disciples to be constantly ready with the boat because the crowd is so big, they may crush me. 
So do you think the disciples are going to be constantly ready? How are they going to be ready? With vigilance. Ready with a fervency. And that's the way Paul is describing how we are to pray. You know that in the Bible, the Apostle Paul gives many exhortations about praying fervently, praying consistently. In Romans 12, 12, he encourages the Romans to pray steadfastly. The same description. Ephesians 6, 18, he exhorts those in Ephesus to pray for him. In Philippians 4, 4, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, we're encouraged and exhorted and commanded to pray without ceasing. We heard in 1 Timothy 2, 1, where Timothy was exhorted to pray, that the men are to lift up holy hands and pray in the church. You remember the stories the Lord told. Luke 11, where he describes two neighbors. One neighbor has a man come to him, visiting him in the middle of the night, and he goes to the other neighbor, and he pounds on the door. And he won't let up until that man wakes up, gets out of bed, unlocks the door, and brings him some bread. And why did the Lord tell us that story, that unforgettable story? So that you would be constant and diligent in prayer. Because the, if that man, because of the persistence of his neighbor, will, get to open, will open the door and hear him, how much more will God, who is good and kind and wants to hear your prayers? You remember Daniel. Daniel in the lion's den, right? Where the people who wanted to kill him, they knew he was faithful in prayer. They knew, oh, it's four o'clock. It's time. Daniel's going to be praying now. Yep, we can go by his place. See, there he is in the window. They can mark their clocks by him. So if you know these stories, why are you not diligent in prayer? Do you, you remember Jacob? And Jacob would not let go of the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christophany when he, said, he held on to the angel of Yahweh saying, I will not let you go until you bless me. Do you pray that way? You remember Hannah. Hannah, who is living in that home with polygamy, and she did not have a baby, and she cried out to the Lord. When she was mocked, she cried out to the Lord in fervent prayer. You remember the Lord, how he tells the story in Luke 18 about the persistent widow who will continue to pray. She will continue to come to the judge who doesn't fear God and he doesn't fear man, but why, why will he answer this widow? Because of her persistency. It's the same idea. And yet, look back on your week. How many hours did you pray? Did you pray for hours? Did you pray for minutes? How many seconds did you pray? You know God has made the fabric of life so that you have to pray? He made you so you need food. He made you so you need sleep. He made you so you need prayer. With your food, three times a day, your stomach starts to growl. Maybe if some of you, your stomach will start to growl before the sermon's over. And that is a message. That is, the fabric of life is made so that you need God. You have to lay your head on the pillow each night and say, I'm not sovereign. I'm not sovereign. I'm not sovereign. I need to sleep. Every 24 hours, I need to have a chunk of time where I admit I'm not sovereign. God has made life so you are dependent upon Him. And so it is with prayer. Prayer should be the breathing in and breathing out of the Christian. Constant. Ever aware. And setting aside time for it. Believe me, it is both. The person who simply says, well, I will go through life, and I will pray as I go, their prayers will be shallow. Like when the little girl prays, God bless everybody in the world. The kind of prayer that can't be answered, it won't be answered because it's not God's will. 
but if your prayers are constant and set aside time. Think through now. Why do you not pray? You don't pray because of pride. You think you don't need it. You think that you can make it through a day without the Lord. You think that you can make it through this hour without the Lord. Believe me, you can't make it through this sermon without the Lord. You should be praying in this sermon that God would give you grace to listen and hear. Pride is what keeps you from prayer. The humble man prays and prays fervently. Maybe you don't pray because of the busyness of life. Very often that is another expression of your pride. That you think that everything's got to be done by you. So you plan such a busy life. People ask you, how are you doing? Well, I'm busy. And you do it with a grieving, dragging your feet. Well, I'm just so virtuous that I have a busy life. But you don't humbly look at your schedule and say, what is of necessity? What I, must I say no to so that I can pray? Because this thing, this thing is well worth your time. This thing you must do with fervency. Maybe you don't pray because of worldly neglect. You don't realize the life and death battle that we're in. Your mind is full of entertainment, TV, relationships, jokes. And you don't see the tears that are being shed in this week. You don't see the life and death battle, the deceit that Satan has, the need for the gospel to go forward. Maybe you don't see the need because your mind is full of things that are passing away. And that's why you don't pray. Maybe you don't pray because of the wicked sin of unbelief. You don't pray because you don't think the Lord is actually going to use it. Even though He says He will, you call God a liar with your actions. Because you think, if I really pray, it's not going to bring about effect. That's wicked unbelief. And Jesus preached against unbelief as much as any other sin. And unbelief will keep you from prayer. Maybe you don't pray because you're apathetic and lazy. You're just too tired to pray. You've earned your break today. God knows. I tell you, this is something worth putting your mind to. This is something worth working at, is prayer. Because th this will be used by God in a great and effective way. Maybe you don't pray because you're simply ignorant and you're new to this thing of Christianity and you don't know the importance of prayer. Well, let me help you today. Let me help you today by telling you over and over about the importance of prayer. Maybe you don't pray because of lack of joy. You think you will be happier if you, do, you spend your time in this way as opposed to praying. And I tell you, no, when you obey the commands of the Lord, that's what makes the Christian happy. That's what gives him a clean conscience. That obeying the command to pray will be more joyous to you. You will not regret it. You will not regret a single prayer. Maybe you don't pray because you're unconverted. Jonathan Edwards had a sermon entitled, Hypocrites, Deficient in the Duty of Prayer. And in the sermon, he's marking out the, and pointing out, you see, false Christians, they don't pray. Maybe they'll pray publicly, where all can see. Maybe they'll pray at small group, where everyone else is praying. But when they're alone, at their home, they neglect the Lord. And like a hypocrite, like someone who loves their child at church, but then at home, disdains them. They do the same to the Lord. At church, yes, Lord. 
with a fake smile. I love you, but at home, what is your prayer life like? Let's look at James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verse 16. He says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed that it would not rain. And, he did, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Let's look at that story of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18. First Kings chapter 18. In this time, Elijah had a, it was a time a lot like ours. Much false worship. Many false worshipers of God who go to the places of worship but are hypocrites. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, the, the, the prophet Elijah, in times like that, you know what the prophet will pray for? He will pray for the judgment of God to come so that the people will turn to God. And he prays so that the rain would stop. And in verse, chapter 18, verse 1, it says, It came to pass after many days the word of the Lord said to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. When the prophet prays that the rain would stop, it is a horrible, horrific event that we cannot conceive in our culture and time. Can you imagine going to Publix and there is no food on the shelf? Your money means nothing because there's no food to buy. A loaf of bread goes for a hundred bucks. Your money's running out. Children and widows, the shut-ins are the ones who die. People starving, years without rain, and the food is running out. So the prophet prays for the judgment of God to come in order that the people may receive the grace of God. And so when the Lord tells Elijah to get Ahab and get ready, because now will be a time of grace. So Elijah gets ready. And in chapter 18, we have the showdown at Carmel where the prophets of Baal and the prophet Elijah compare who is really God. And in verse 36, we're going to pick up. We're going to pick up Elijah's prayer. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah, the prophet, came near. So the prophets of Baal have had their chance. They failed. And Elijah, he prays one short prayer. Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. And then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. What an answer to prayer. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, Yahweh, 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 the Lord, He is God. 
Yahweh, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and executed them there. So now, the Lord heard Elijah's prayer. But I think James has something else in mind when he talks about Elijah's fervent prayer. It's his prayer for mercy here in verse 41. Verse 41, he says, that Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. So wicked Ahab, he doesn't really care about the prophets of Baal. He knows that who wears the pants in the family. He knows his wife back home. She's going to be upset about it. She's the one who really likes the prophets of Baal, wicked Jezebel. He's really there. He's got a meal planned. See how, how selfish this is in a time of famine? He's got this meal planned. And Elijah with disdain is like, go up and eat your meal. And he says, but there's the sound of abundance of rain coming. In this time of repentance where the people are turning. So Ahab went up to eat in verse 42 and drink. And Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. And then he bowed down on the ground. He put his face between his knees so that the dirt is going to be on his nose. In humility, he knows how badly the people need the mercy of God. They need the mercy of God in repentance. They need the mercy of God in this rain coming. And he says to his servant, he lifts up his face, and he says to his servant, go, go up and look towards the sea. And the servant goes up, and he looks, clear blue sky, not a cloud in the sky. And all that time, Elijah is praying, God, be merciful. God, hear my prayers. God, you promised that you would send the rain, and the sky is bare. And the man comes back, the servant comes back, and Elijah said, looks up and he says, go, go back. Go back and look. I believe that the Lord will hear my prayers. So the servant goes. He goes and he's like, he looks and he's like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing here. There's still no clouds. And he goes back again. And Elijah is buying more time. He is fervent for the mercy of God to come to his country. Or do you have that fervency? Do you pray like this, with your face in the dirt, praying for the mercy of God to come to your family, praying for the mercy of God to come to your co-workers, praying for the mercy of God to come to your nation? And again, he sends away the servant. Not four times, not five times, not six times. Seven times he prays and prays and prays and prays. And then the servant comes and he looks one more time. And he says, what's that, seagull? No. He says in verse, 40, says verse 44, then it came to pass the seventh time, he said, there's a cloud as small as a man's hand. Now that's an itty bitty cloud. As small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. Well, at least I got something to report. And he tells it to Elijah. And what does Elijah do? Immediately. Go up and say to Ahab, the storm is coming. The Lord has answered my prayer. What faith? And he says, go tell Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. And he knows the tornado of the mercy of God is coming. Do you pray this way? And what does James exhort you? You are a man just like Elijah. Do not think that Elijah is somehow, if he were to walk in, he would somehow have a halo on his head, some, like some sort of Catholic painting. No, you wouldn't recognize him. He'd be just like everybody else. He's a man of flesh and bones, and his prayers are just like your prayers. Do you see your prayer with that power that you could stop the sky if God were to be merciful do you come to God like that do you plead like that 
Do you pray constantly like that? It takes faith to pray like that. For many of you don't have that faith. Come to God in prayer and He will give you that faith. He'll give you the faith to pray, O oh Christian. He'll give you the faith to pray. And I tell you, you will see the answer prayers of the Lord. Amen. I've seen it time and time again. I remember praying under a tree at college on the campus for evangelist opportunity. And a guy came up to me, what are you doing? <laughs> the Lord answers. Be persistent in prayer. Turn back to Colossians. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, he commands. There's two commands in the text. One in verse 2, continue earnestly in prayer, and two, walk in wisdom. This is the first in a series of imperatives, or in this, this text. And he says, continue earnestly in prayer. And the next phrase he uses is saying, be vigilant in it with thanksgiving. The vigilance here is describing being alert, being awake, always on the always ready to pray. This being awake aspect has a particularly convicting message to some of you who fall asleep while you pray. The Lord is saying that you must constantly be seeing the need for this and be ready for it. This word is used by the Lord. When he talks about prayer. You know when he uses it? Let's see that example in Mark 14. The vigilance in prayer. You are to press, press on in prayer in vigilance. In Mark 14. Mark 14 in verses 26 to 31, we're coming up on the most important time in human history. The crucifixion and resurrection of the Lord God Almighty. And they're departing from the Last Supper. And they're walking down the Kidron Valley. They're coming up the Mount of Olives. And there's a very famous conversation happening where Peter is talking with the Lord. And he says in verse 29, Even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be, Lord. I will not be. I will not be. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. What pride. What pride Peter has. And then he, they come to Gethsemane. This place with many olive trees. And they came, verse 32, to the place, which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him. And he began to be troubled, deeply distressed. In the greatest time of the Lord's trial, what is he doing? But praying, fervently in prayer. How much more do you need it? If you think the Lord needs to pray, but you don't, what insanity is that? And Peter, like us, he's got that same insanity. The Lord tries to exhort him, verse 34, and he said to him, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. That word watch is the same word for vigilant. It's the same word that Paul uses to be awake in prayer. And he went a little farther, verse 35, and fell on the ground, just like Elijah. And he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. You see how you're learning from the Lord how to pray? Humbly, praying fervently, praying knowing God is your Father, praying for His will, not your own. And then, verse 37, and then he came and he found them sleeping. 
And then he said to Peter, particularly the Peter, the, the one who led them in pride just a few minutes before, why did he fall asleep? Why did he not stay awake and pray? Because he's pr prideful. Simon, you are sleeping, could you not? Watch one hour. Again, the word, same word. He says, now he says in verse 38, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And what happened to Peter? Did he stay awake? Did he stay vigilant in prayer? No. No. And what happened? He went into the sin of denying the Lord. And when he looked across the courtyard to see the, the Lord arrested, and he locks eyes with the Lord, and he remembers, and the cock crows. And he thinks, what a fool I am that I did not pray. How could I have sinned in this way? And he goes out and weeps bitterly. You don't need to be a fool. You can learn from what Peter has done here. And you can pray fervently. In fact, the Lord commands you to pray that way. Lest you enter into temptation. Trials, they drive us to pray, don't they? They drive us to pray. Because it's the fabric of life. It is how the Lord has made life. And in some particular times, he gives you hard times so that you know how much you need him. And you go on your face again. When you really should be that way in every day, every time. When you look at your cupboard, you should say, I don't know that that food will go from the cupboard to my mouth. Lord, please provide for me my daily bread, day by day. When you go to work, you should pray. Not arrogantly, well, I've done this job for 10 years. No, you should pray, Lord, help me to honor you. You should not be, as a mother, well, I have six children now, and I know how to be a good, godly mother. But no, you should pray daily, help me to be, lead up my children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You should be desperate, vigilant, awake, persistent in prayer. That is your ministry with the world. Let's turn back to Colossians. We see another aspect in Colossians chapter 4 of the prayer, that it is to be one of thanksgiving. In chapter 2, he says, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. The Apostle Paul set a wonderful example for us with that thanksgiving prayer. Turn to chapter 1, verse 3. He says, We give thanks to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints. You see how thankful he is? He's thankful that the, the people of Colossae have become Christians. Look at verse 9. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard, do not cease to pray for you. Why doesn't he stop to praying? And what does he pray for? He prays that the people might be filled with the knowledge of his will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. They may know what God really wants and live it out with their life in a spiritual understanding. In verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. He's praying. I'm constantly praying that the church at Colossae would walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, that they may know Him, that they may know God. What else does He pray for? In this long prayer, He says, strengthen. I pray that they might be strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy. He says, I know the suffering's coming, and I'm praying that they would receive it with great joy. 
giving thanks to the Father, in verse 12, who has qualified us to become partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. You see, Paul was thankful in prayer. Also in chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, he says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as you've been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. You should be thankful in prayer. Turn the page to chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Keep the Bible in you. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You see how you're supposed to be singing to the Lord in thankful prayer? Some of you have bouts of depression. Where you go through your week and you think, Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrows. And you need to sing the Bible. You need to sing the Bible to the Lord. There is a reason why the Psalms continually exhort you. Sing to the Lord, sing to the Lord, sing to the Lord, sing to the Lord. Because you're supposed to sing to the Lord. What, a th what amazing work it does in your heart to sing to God with thanksgiving. And it's in the context of our text of how the Christian goes about living in this way. Because the Word of God is dwelling in him, and he's singing it back to the Lord. In verse 17, he says, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And even in chapter 4, verse 12, we have the example of Epaphras who is one of you. He was from Colossae. A bondservant of Christ greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So now back to chapter 4, verse 2. What are you supposed to do? Point number one. You are to press on in prayer, constantly awake with thanksgiving. So what are you to pray for? Point number two. Pray for your brothers. Verses 3 to 4. Pray for your brothers. Look at what, how the Apostle Paul asks for a prayer request. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the Word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. So he says... Pray for me. Pray for me. That he says that the word of God may go forward. Do you pray fervently, vigilantly for open doors for the gospel? Do you pray for Lake Eola? Do you pray for Crane's Roost? Do you pray for, for the people going throughout the week? Do you pray for, for Saturday morning, door to door? You cannot attend all these events. Some of you have tried by God's grace, and you cannot attend them. So what do you do? Let your prayers go with them. You can't, many of you can't go to Bolivia. So your prayers can be there. Many of you can't be with Mike Abendroth, or many of you can't be with Pastor Mateo in Bolivia. Many of you can't be in these places, but your prayers can go. Many of you can't be with the pastors during the week, but your prayers can go. Paul is humble knowing that the opportunity for the gospel comes through prayer. It's literally and figuratively for us because we go door to door. That door won't open unless the Lord opens it. When it opens a little bit and you see the person's eye and they say, who is it? You know, the Lord has opened that door. When you see the person who's at work You've been wanting and praying for the opportunity to evangelize them. And it, the Lord works it out just the way that, that you're walking to your car at the same time. And their car just happens to be parked right next to yours. And you just happen to be holding your Bible that you read at break time. 
the Lord has opened that door. The Lord holds back weather so you can preach the gospel. The Lord sets up circumstances so you can preach the gospel. Particular people come along just at the right time. And the, Paul knows how dependent he is on the Lord for this. But do you realize it? Do you pray in that way? That dependent, that fervent, begging God for an open door. Do you pray for your pastors? Do you pray for your small group? Do you pray for your family? Do you pray for your missionaries? Do you remember at the end of Acts, Luke adds this, where adds this little note that where Paul was in house arrest in Rome, he was able to preach the gospel, the kingdom of God. Why was he able to do that? Because of the answered prayer. The, all the answered prayer. Do you remember in Philippians when he says, even though I'm in chains, I've been able to witness to, the, the, to Caesar's guard, the Praetorian guard. Why was that? Because of the answered prayer. When the Bolivia team comes back, and those of you who have prayed faithfully, and you see the results, and you see what has happened that is honoring to Christ, you know what you can say with a clean conscience? Look, Lord, praise your name. You heard my prayers for eternal work. But if they come back and they give their post testimony, and you say, oh, yes, I should have been praying for them, you will feel the guilt. The Lord commands you to pray. For an open door that he, in Paul's prayer, is that he may speak the mystery of Christ for which I'm in chains. In verse 3. Pray that the mystery of Christ may be spoken despite the cost. Do you know what the mystery of Christ is? The mystery of Christ is what was not revealed in the Old Testament about the gospel and now is revealed in the New Testament. In Romans eleven twenty five, 25, he talks about how the mystery, this particular aspect of the mystery is where the, the Jewish people become hardened so that Gentiles may come in. That's part of the mystery. In Romans 16, at the very end of the book, verses 25 to 27, he looks back at the book of Romans and the message of the gospel and he says, that was an amazing mystery revealed. In Mark 4, verse 11, when the Lord is giving parables, He says, you know what these reveal? These re parables reveal the mystery of the kingdom. Let's look in Colossians, and it'll define the mystery for us. Colossians, chapter 1, verse 19. The mystery is the gospel. And how does He preach the gospel in Colossians? Test yourself if this gospel is in you. Verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell. That Jesus Christ is God of gods, fully God, fully man. All things have been made by Him. All things are for Him. <clears throat> Do you see the Lord Jesus Christ in that way? Is He not just, is He Lord in name only to you? This one who has made you, this one who has, who has revealed to you his character and his word. He's come to reconcile you. You don't come seeking him, but in verse 20, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. This God, who has the authority to cast you into hell, instead, He comes to you to reconcile you to Himself. What mercy and what kindness. Because in your hypocrisy, most of us have believed ourselves to be Christians. And in verse 21, you are alienated and enemies of God in your mind by wicked works. You believed because of your many prayers, whether one prayer 
or many prayers that you trusted in. You believe that you have been close to God. But in hypocrisy, we were enemies of God and away from Him. Our good actions did nothing to bring us to God. You are not a good person. You are not a good person. You are not a good person. And when you realize that, you're beginning to understand the mystery of the gospel. That you're separated from Him and an enemy of God by your wicked works. But He comes forward to reconcile you, yet now He is reconciled in the body of His flesh through death to present you holy and blameless without reproach in His sight. What mercy of God to wash away all your sins, to give you holiness, to give you blamelessness. And this faith, this genuine Christianity, it is one that continues on till death. It continues on in verse 23. It is no mere ritual. If indeed you continue in faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you've heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. This is the mystery to be revealed to you, that God is Lord Jesus Christ, that He is your sovereign, He is your master, you are His slave, and that you have been His enemy, but He reconciles you. You don't reconcile yourself to Him, and when he does, he makes you holy, blameless, and continuing on till death. In Paul, in verses 24 to 25, he describes his ministry of revealing this mystery. And then in verse 26, he says, The word of God, the mystery, which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to the saints. This is what Paul wants to preach. This is what Paul is asking for a prayer request so that he would make it clear. In verse 27, he says, To them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is mystery like? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That Christ himself would be inside you. What hope, what wonderful good news is this? That if you acknowledge these truths, you turn from your sin, you repent and believe in this gospel, then you can be forgiven, holy, pure, and blameless. You will have Christ in you, the hope of glory. Back in chapter 4. His prayer request is that he may make the mystery of Christ known. And he suffers for it, for which I'm in chains. He's in chains then, when he's writing this. Later in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, he says how he's in chains, but he says the word of God is not chained. And that's what he prays for here. That though he's in literal change, that he prays that the word of the Lord may run, may run. And in verse 4, he says, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Manifest is often a word that's used with the mystery. And it simply means to be made clear. Do you pray for that? Pray that the gospel preaching may be clear. That people may understand it. Pray for the evangelist. Pray for your brother. Pray for your sister. That they may speak as they ought to speak. And this word ought is an important word. It means must. It is the word day in Greek. And it means it is necessary. The exegetical dictionary of the New Testament says about this about day. In the New Testament, statements with day or must in English are normally understood more or less as divine decrees. What they're saying in this theological dictionary is that when you see this word, it means it's because of a divine decree that must be obeyed. God has commanded the Apostle Paul that he must, must, must speak. Do you pray for your brothers like that? 
This word for must is used in Acts 5.29 when the Peter and John were before the Sanhedrin. And they said, we must obey God rather than men. Same word. It's used, Christ used it many times to describe his, his death. He says, I must go to Jerusalem. I must be given up and crucified. Jesus used this word when he described having to go through Samaria to witness to the, the Samaritan woman at the well. He says, I must, I must go through Samaria. And now the Apostle Paul uses it. And he says, I must speak the gospel. And he knows he must speak. You see the, the balance of God's sovereignty. And he knows that God must act. He's a Calvinist. He knows that he needs these prayer requests. But he also knows his responsibility. He's a true Calvinist. He knows he must speak the gospel. He said this before. You remember where he said in 1 Corinthians 9? Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. You remember in, first, in Romans chapter 1, verses 14 to 15, I'm a debtor to Jews and Greeks. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's something he must do. You remember in Acts 20 where he says, I'm, I don't have the blood of, of you on my hands. I'm innocent because I've preached the whole counsel of God to you. So now, if you were to press on in prayer and you were to pray for your brothers, what is the final point? In verses 5 and 6, this text linked together, but that you would have walk in wisdom. What kind of wisdom? Are you supposed, is this talking about right living? Well, look at the context. He just spoke about the ne his necessity to preach the gospel. And he says, walk in wisdom, not generally. Walk in wisdom with those who are outside. He's speaking about intentional evangelism. Not merely go as you go, but he's saying you must set aside a time for it. You know how you do it wisely? You set aside the time. You look at your calendar. Okay, this time, this time, this time. I'm going to set it aside, and I'm going to do it. That's wise. He who wins souls, Proverbs 11.30, is wise. That is true wisdom. And it is a command here for you as the church it's a command corporately and a command individually because it's a letter to the church. Walk in wisdom with those who are outside. How do we do that, Paul? How do we do that? Redeem the time. This is the same word. Redeeming the time is buying it back. It's a marketplace term. It's used for particular redemption, particular atonement. How the Lord bought particular people the same word here is used for buying particular time. You got like whole, a number of bucks that are worth time. It's, t it's uh, just like money. So much time you have, and then you're out. What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your time? What keeps you from evangelism? Do you think, well... Do you think pragmatically it's not worth the time? I got so many other things to do. People aren't going to get saved anyway. The other brothers will go anyway. Do you think pragmatically like that? No faith? I tell you, be wise. Redeem the time. Buy the time. You will not regret it. Are you afraid of man? Is that why you don't use the time? Is it unbelief? Are you hearing the same sins are keeping you from prayer as they do that keep you from evangelism? You lack the joy. It will make me happier if I don't do it. I don't have the time. I'm too busy. And I warn you, it may be the same unconverted state that keeps you from prayer, keeps you from evangelism. The mark of someone who does not evangelize is, that's the mark of an unbeliever. That's what the Lord said in Matthew chapter 11. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father in the context of evangelism. So walk with wisdom, redeeming the time. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 
as an example of this exhortation to redeem the time. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. So what should we do, Paul? So that from now on, those who have wives should be as though they had none. Those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy as though they did not possess. And those who use this world as not misusing it. For the form of this world is passing away. This is by no means is contradicting what Paul has already preached about the importance of caring for your family. But he is saying that you got to have such an understanding of time that even your family will one day pass away. And what matters? What matters? But did you walk in wisdom? Redeem the time. You will not regret it. Like John Bunyan tells stories about when angels that come to him. He's not charismatic. He wasn't a charismatic. They were just parables that he would tell. Allegories. Hear, hear a parable now. An angel comes to you. And he says to you, I want to show you the importance of how you use your time. Come with me to heaven. And the angel brings you up to heaven. And you're shocked. You say, when will we meet the Lord? He says, I'm not going to let you meet the Lord because you won't want to go back. He says, but I have someone else for you to meet. And you get over your disappointment, but you understand. And he, he comes up to this fat British man. And you say, oh, I know who this is. This is Charles Spurgeon. And he says, the angel introduces you to Spurgeon. And Spurgeon says to you, my son, do you know what I would do if I had more time? I would preach about the cross. I would take Isaiah 53, a text that's worthy for an angel, this angel to speak, and if I had more time, I would speak about the cross to everyone I came across. My time is up, but yours is not. And the angel says, we must move on. Let me show you Jonathan Edwards. And he comes up to Jonathan Edwards, and Jonathan Edwards tells you, dear believer, you still have time. If I had time, you know what I would say? I would tell people about the glory of Christ and how heaven is unspeakably joyous. And I would warn them about sinners in the hands of an angry God and how hell is horrendous. But you have time. The angel takes you on. He takes you on to George Whitfield. And Whitfield says, oh, but one more time. One more time to preach of the gospel in the open air. And to see the tears flowing down the faces of sinners as they come to the Savior. Oh, but one more time. And he tells you with all the emotion and all the vigor he used to preach. And then he preaches to you. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your time. It will soon be gone. And what's done for Christ lasts. Your prayers. You're walking in wisdom with the lost. And then the angel, he takes you to the edge of hell. And you look down and you recognize someone. And you say, didn't I not go to church with him? Here's before. And the angel allows him to speak. And he speaks with gritting teeth and curses. I used my time. I was at church. I spoke to others about the gospel. He says, and I read my Bible 
I gave my finances. And as Christ sends me to this place, and the angel takes you away from the edge of the cliff and he says, you see, he used his time for himself. All the religious things he did were not for Christ. They were not to make them manifest, to make it clear, the mystery of Christ. They were to, so that he would consider how, what a good person he is. That's why he curses Christ now. He thinks he uses his time for the Lord, but he didn't. He used it all for himself, all the time the Lord gave him. He used it saying Jesus, but he's trying to use Jesus' name for his own glory. An angel takes you, he brings you back to earth, he tells you how will you use your time. Don't let the witness and the testimony of others go for nothing. Don't let the Apostle Paul's command here go for nothing. Redeem the time. Take that time. Take that time and don't let go of it. Set it aside and say, I will pray. I will use it for wisdom with those who are outside. I will not waste my life. I will not waste my time. You will never regret it. So I tell you, in order to do this faithfully, consistently, you must take a stand. You must man up and take a stand for Christ. Your time will run away with you. And you've got to say, what is important? You've got to humble yourself and say, what I will not do in order to get what is necessary, what I must do. So I plead with you, do that. Do that for the Lord. And you can only do that if you understand the mystery of Christ, if that work has been done in you. So he says in verse Five, you must redeem the time. And he says in the last verse, he says, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. This is an appropriate balance. We need it. Because some of us will rush out like tigers, gobbling up the next person we see. But he says, when you speak to them, remember the grace of God in your life. And remember, when you speak to them, speak to them graciously, kindly. If you're not ready to cry over a soul, then you're not ready to preach that soul about the wrath of God. Doesn't Jeremiah preach much about the wrath of God? And what is he known? He's known as the weeping prophet. Are you that way? Do you have the kind, gracious words? Some people don't have them because they don't understand grace. And they, but they know the responsibility to preach. So they just preach the wrath. But they don't do it in a gracious way. The Lord Jesus Christ was a great example of preaching the grace and wrath at the same time. Graciously. And there's a, there's a figure of speech here that's used to highlight that. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. In the Greco-Roman world, this is something that is used to express witty speech. You know the appropriate answer for the appropriate time. You know when to yell, and you know when to whisper. You know when to put your hand on the person and cry with them, and you, and you know when to make them laugh, and you know when to make them feel guilty. And you know how that's gracious to them. Learn this wisdom. Learn this wisdom. And this verse ends, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Do you see that word ought? You remember it? From verse 4? The same divine necessity. And now, Paul does not say it about himself, but who does he say it to? The church. He doesn't say it to the parachurch. 
He says it to you. He says it to you corporately, and he says it to you individually. That you must, must speak the gospel. You must know how to answer. You must respond in this way. It is a divine necessity. Many churches, even churches with the true gospel, they speak of this dichotomy that is unnecessary, this, this contradiction that is unnecessary, where they say, well, we, have, we don't want to have programs of evangelism. We just want to have a culture of evangelism. So they don't set aside a time to do it. They don't redeem the time. Some people do it individually in those churches and praise God. But there is no, there's no contradiction between having a culture of evangelism where people talk about evangelism and do it in their own daily life and they set aside a time for it. These two things go together. Just like the prayer, where the prayer where you pray constantly on your own and you pray assembled in the church. See the context here. See that this is a divine necessity for you. See that this destroys evangelizing as you go, but instead you set up a time. Set up a time. To close, let's look at the, the Lord Jesus Christ and how he used his time. In Mark 1, verses 35 to 39, what was his ministry with the world? Word with the world. His ministry with the world was one of praying fervently, praying for the believers, and then finally walking with wisdom for the lost. In Mark 1, 35, he says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. When was the last time you woke up in the middle of the night to pray? Jesus knows that he needs it. Are you humble enough to know that you need it? And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. How did the Lord Jesus Christ use his time? But to pray fervently, to pray for others, and to walk with wisdom with the lost. In the parallel passage in Luke 4, 43, you know what word he uses? He uses day. He uses I must. He says, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. So go, go, dear Christians, with this use of your time. And Christ will be honored. I exhort you one more time. One more time before I close. Because my time is short. I don't know when I will pass away. Take your calendar and say, well, how can I please Christ with my calendar? How can I please Christ with my time budget? And set aside... Just like you do for tithe, you set aside this first, set aside what is needy, what the Lord tells you to do. And do it with a fervency. Do it with a commitment that you want to please Him. This is the right response to the gospel. This is the right response to the gospel. Set it up. I, I tell you, I'm going to make my stand. I'm going to make my stand to use my time by God's grace for His glory. Like a mighty man of David, where Shema, where he takes the, the lentil field and he posts, he takes a stake and he ties a rope to that stake and he says, come on Philistines, I'm not giving up this field. I'm going to stand my ground. Do that with your commitment for the Lord, where you stand your ground and say, this is... I will use for the Lord. It is the least you can do for our Lord. Let's pray.
Dear God, I'm so thankful that we get to pray to you now in a sermon on prayer, and we get to do it together as a church. We pray, Lord, we need help to understand the mystery of the gospel daily in our lives so that by that, by what you've done, we would be have these desires and this obedience in our life to pray fervently, to pray for our brothers, to walk with wisdom of the lost. Lord, we want to honor you and please you. We love you, Lord. Thank you for giving us an example of how you spend your time. I won't, we want to spend our time like you did, Lord. So help us to do that. Amen.